Hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Gabe Gunnick, and I have the privilege of joining you all this evening as we relive along with Rick his fall adventures around Mont Blanc, Italy, and Athens. Now, without further ado, I would like to turn things over to our tour guide for this evening, Rick Steves. Rick, over to you. Hey, Gabe, thanks so much. And thanks to everybody for joining us on this Monday night travel. Normally, we give you clips from our TV shows and we have a little video festival of travel. But tonight, I get to just do the old fashioned slideshow and share with you my favorite adventures from this fall's travel. As Gabe mentioned, it's going to be kind of a two part evening. The first part will be my vacation, actually, hiking around Mount Blanc. I just had such a wonderful time. And then we're going to take some Q&A and a little break. And then we'll talk about what I did when I went back later, just earlier uh, this month. And uh, we did a guides mentoring tour with 25 guides on our bus for a 10 day tour, our Heart of Italy tour, in which I got to be the guide. And I got to share with all of our younger guides what makes a Rick Steves tour special. And then the guides all flew back to their various homes in across Europe and I met with my crew, Simon the producer and Carl the cameraman and we shot 12 days of glorious art in Florence, Rome and Athens. So we've got a lot of travels coming up and I'm in a great mood. Not, not just because a couple thousand people just virtually walked into my house to let me show them photographs and enthuse about my travels, which I love, by the way, every Monday. But because about two hours ago, I took delivery of a new refrigerator. And I'm excited about that because, you know, for many years or for many Mondays, people were looking at my drink cooler here and seeing what my drinks were. But for the last three or four months, there's just been food in there because my big fancy refrigerator over there went out. And when you buy a big fancy built-in refrigerator, you got to just get a certain kind. And we've been hearing about this supply chain. And that was in July. And I've been living out of my little drink cooler ever since then. And it has had a crimp in my cooking style, I've got to say. So I'm still not knowing when this thing's going to get here. But I decided to buy just a basic refrigerator stick out in the garage. So now I got cold drinks instead of tap water. So that's one thing people notice. Also, people notice the Beatles over here. There's my friends, John, Paul, George, and Ringo. I'm kind of in a Beatles mood because I'm enjoying this uh, get back special that they're running right now. And then it occurred to me, I've always got this Tuscany halo over my head. I don't know if you, yeah, I guess you can see it there. And that's just a cool thing that was hanging on the wall when I bought this house. <laughs> and I just, I'm not much of a decorator. So the people that were here before liked it and, and I'm all over Tuscany. So I'm glad to have you here. Make yourself right at home. Right now we're going to go to Europe and we're just going to, we're just going to celebrate, first of all, a vacation, hiking around Mount Blanc. I want to start off with just a little bit of practical travel tips. You know, when you go hiking in Europe, you're sharing the trail with animals. And when you've got animals, you've got electric fences. And you got to know how to get through them <laughs> smartly. So there you go. You got to grab that rubber handle instead of the actual wire. And it works beautiful. All right. And before we get into our actual tour, I want to start off with uh, the little Where's Rick game so you can have a little fun guessing where I am. We've done 120 episodes over the years of Rick Steve, of travel in Europe with what's it called? Rick Steve's Europe. And each one starts with a tease. And here's five teases. And you all get to guess where we are. It's a drinking game. If you get it right, take a drink. If you get it wrong, take a drink. Let's see where we are. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we explore the city that pulled Europe out of the Middle Ages and into the modern world. Hmm. I was just standing on that same spot three weeks ago with my TV crew. If you're in this city and you want to get a great establishing shot, this is it. You got the Arno River, you got the Ponte Vecchio, you got the old Medici Palace, you got Giotto's Tower, you got Brunelleschi's Dome. And if that didn't give it away, you better go back to your history books and your art books because we are in the place where the Renaissance exploded. Florence. Florence, yeah. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. And this time, we're climbing to the summit of 
And I always say, if you like Italy as far south as Rome, go further south, it gets better. If you want the ultimate in Italy, you go down to the, you know, the boot and the football, you go down to the football and they've got the island dominated by its volcano. Where would we be? Sicily and hoping this volcano doesn't blow. Thanks for joining us. Many times I've been in Sicily and the whole island is blanketed in ash because Mount Etna is doing its thing. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're exploring my favorite lagoon anywhere. So this is sort of best of Italy, really. Uh, where could this lagoon be? I'm with my friend Piero, who runs one of my favorite hotels in this town, Hotel Guarato. And for Piero, he says the people in his little town, which entertains millions of tourists every year, but there's just 60,000 people that live in this little town, which for centuries was the most powerful city in all of Europe. They have a parallel world. The tourists take over the basic world, but if they've got a boat, they have their parallel world. And that world is... It's Venice. Thanks for joining us. And hold on tight. Piero. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're in Italy for the wildest horse race in the world, and we're not alone. Okay, this is that famous horse race where the only rule is there are no rules. It takes over the city, the most wonderful hill town in this part of Italy, twice a year. What's that? It's Siena, the Palio, and a whole lot more. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Nice. All right, well now we're gonna go hiking, okay? And I'll tell you, I'm gonna share some practical tips on what I learned because I was a rank beginner. I had never done anything anywhere remotely like this. This was 60 miles, six days, 10 miles a day. I've done 10 or 15 miles in one long day hike, but I've never done that for six days in a row. And it was just a beautiful experience. It was tough. I mean, it was the limit for my body. I started referring to my body like St. Francis referred to his, his brother mule. Come on, brother mule, you can do it. And one thing I had that St. Francis did not have was great hiking poles. These are just for little people, but you can get big ones for if you're taller, or this is actually telescoping. So you can just unclip it and it gets as big as you like it. But this is elementary to anybody who's hiked. But for me, this was radical, cork handles, wonderful telescoping, and this way you're a quadrupod instead of a bipod, and you are much more stable. You can have help going up, you can have safety going down. I would never do this hike without my walking poles, my hiking poles. And because of that, I couldn't carry my bag onto the airplane like I always do. Well, I carried my bag on, but I had to have another bag for this because this is a dangerous weapon. And um, that let me just have a little extra gear. I had that, uh, we sell a bag called the, we, we nicknamed it the Don't Tell Rick bag. It's a shopping bag for people who go over with one bag, but they wanna go home with two bags. It's our tote, traveling tote bag. And it fits this just perfectly. And I put my extra, my hiking boots in there and a lot of extra hiking gear. And uh, that was enabling me to pack heavier. Okay, but we're gonna go to Mont Blanc. And we did, I just started out with the ultimate hike. This is the ultimate long distance hike in Europe. It's a hundred miles and 10 days, 160 kilometers. I didn't wanna do 10 days and 160 kilometers. I did six days and 60 kilometers, cherry picking just the best days and taking public buses through the boring parts. And I hired a tour company to lay it all out. And um, the tour company I used was called Max Adventures. And um, I thought Max Adventures was just great. I talked to other people that had other tour companies and it's basically the same thing. I think they do a great job on that. And they line up your hotels, they line up your dinners, they make the reservations for you. They organize a Sherpa service that takes your bag from one hotel to the next hotel. So you just walk with your day bag all day long. And it was a great experience. I'm gonna tell you why, just, I just keep thinking about it. I just love it. Let's just go right now to Chamonix, high in the French Alps. Now, when you think about Chamonix, you think about, I think about gondolas. These gondolas are going up, well, they're, they're about, they're going from the Aguido Midi over the Sea of Ice to Italy, to Hellbrenner Point. But they go up to this pinnacle that looks over at Mont Blanc. And from there, you hike around, or you hike around that. And uh, it's the Mont Blanc Massif. I was there two or three years ago with the TV crew. And um, this is Simon and Carl. 
and we uh, had the help of Cassandra Overby, who writes the guidebook for long distance walks all around Europe. She flew over and she was our guide for this for a couple of days. And we faked like we were hiking around Mount Blanc. I had so much fun faking it that I wanted to go back on vacation. And it's been, if you ask my staff and my friends and loved ones, they know I really don't take vacations in Europe. When I go to Europe, I work and I love it. I'm not complaining. I just love my work. But this was an actual vacation. And uh, oh, man, I, I did it with my girlfriend, Shelly, and two friends from Minneapolis. Uh, and uh, we had to get all the gear and we were steep on the learning curve with gear. And uh, we got a great bag. We had our walking sticks. I have yeah, $40, you got to pay for a water bottle, but that metal water bottle, I, I had a bad attitude about until about day two. And then I realized this is the best 40 bucks you could spend because that water is critical. It tastes good and it stays cold. Uh, the the high-tech bag was a wonder. You know, we've got a, a little bag that we sell at, at Rick Steve's Europe, which I love. This is our Chibi Today bag. It costs $25. Everything's on sale right now because of our Christmas sale. So they're off between 20 and 50% off. Uh, and I wouldn't, you could give me the fanciest bag in the world, and I'd rather have this Chibi Today bag, which I've helped design for the cities. It's a beautiful thing. But I don't want this bag in the mountains, that's for sure. I want to get a fancy bag. And this is Osprey. And it was just wonderful. It was really good. So smart. Wool. You need wool. I didn't know anything about wool before this trip. And then, you know, it's just fun to do something new. You have your underpants, your undershirts, your overshirts, your mittens, your, your hat. You got your down vest that fits in its own little pocket. And you layer it. Layering it is critical. I brought a heavy coat and I never used it. It's total waste. I just layered it all the time. Because you don't know what the weather's going to be like. You peel and you add and you peel and you take it off and you add. And it just depends. How high are you? And what's the weather like? The weather blows in and the weather blows out. Just looking at that makes me happy. Six days, six or seven hours a day of walking, great dinners. Now, I packed heavy. I didn't know what to pack. I packed all sorts of extra stuff. And uh, you leave your bag at the hotel in the morning. And uh, you see it in the lobby of the hotel that night on the other side of the mountain as you hiked all day long. <laughs> Not a lot of wildlife. This is the only wildlife we saw. It was a, a little mouse that somebody stepped on on the trail. Uh, not a lot of mountain uh, life except for other hikers. And that was fine with me. Uh, great shoes. These modern, uh, you know, like, like super, super tennis shoes for the mountains. Really, really smart. Good shoes. Enjoyed that. Take care of your feet. I was, um, I was really pretty serious about uh, the the well, the, just being proactive about staying safe and comfortable and healthy and in one piece. And you want to take care of your feet. We had these toesy socks, which seem kind of silly, especially if you got shoes as big as feet as big as mine, but uh, they worked quite well. And uh, I used toesy um, inner socks, liners, and then regular uh, outer socks, and then mole skin, mole skin or whatever. Uh, when you've got a hot spot, you before it becomes a blister, you wrap it up. I don't care if it's a Band-Aid or, or masking tape or a moleskin. You want to wrap it up because that way you avoid the blisters. And then, because uh, it's tough on your toes. And you also put some powder in there if you want to slip around and not have any abrasiveness. Uh, but that's basically right there, my, my outfit for the day. Uh, you got your walking sticks. You got your beautiful metal water bottle. You got your high-tech day bag. And you got your layers. And every night you come to a town, a town that much as I know Europe, I didn't know any of these towns. Every night we come into a different town. They were charming and they handled the, the, the hikers. That was their whole industry. The hikers come in, the hikers go out. Everybody just stays for one night. You can see the lounge chairs there looking out from our hotel window, a beautiful little church and you're surrounded by Alpine Wonder. This is another one of the hotels and refuges that you can stay in. All it's a, it's a little mini industry. How do you accommodate all these hikers on this venerable Tour de Mont Blanc, the, the Mont Blanc Tour? And this was a mountain refuge. You can stay in a fancy hotel, or you can stay in a rough mountain hut, or you can stay in a refuge. This refuge, we slept there with our TV crew. Uh, you know, you hike from eight o'clock in the morning until three o'clock in the afternoon, and then you do your chores for an hour. 
and then you're ready to just relax and you have a beer and you hang out with other hikers and then they ring the bell and you all go in and you have uh, dinner together. In a mountain hut, you are sharing your room. You have mattress, uh, it's a mattress loft and uh, you've got between four and, and 15, 16 beds in a room. If you pay extra, you can get a double room, but they're not designed for that. The etiquette is you take off your hiking boots and you put on clogs that they provide for you. So you keep things you know, cozy inside. This is uh, the uh, dinner room at that hotel. And I'll just never forget the, the meal we had there. It was gorgeous. And when you've been hiking all day, you don't need a menu. You'll just take whatever they're cooking. Just give me your best stuff. And it really was great food and a great positive energy. Here's another mountain hut. And this is just a classic mountain hut. And it's like a big hostel for adults, for hikers. And uh, in the morning, again, people leave their big bag. I mean, certain hardcore hikers will carry their stuff with them. And a lot of people will just camp. I mean, they do the whole thing almost for the cost of groceries because they don't pay to sleep and they don't pay for the Sherpa service. Uh, other people sleep in mountain uh, hostels and uh, Sherpa services and people who want to spend more money like us, they stay mostly in fancy hotels and do the Sherpa service. But here in the hostel, you still see people leaving their bags and they'll all find those bags that next night, depending on where they're hiking. This is the kind of hotel we would often stay in. And uh, it was just great. Nice dinner waiting for us. I mean, really good food. Remember, you're hiking through France, you're hiking through Italy, and you're hiking through Switzerland. Actually, I had a swimming pool one night. This is a beautiful family-run hotel we stayed at. Their dining room. And getting to know the family. Beautiful people. And this is back in Chamonix, where you got the mountaineers from 200 years ago pointing breathlessly up at that bald summit of Mount Blanc, the highest point in Europe, 15,000 feet above sea level, higher than Mount Rainier. So I want to remind you, when you do the Tour de Mont Blanc, you're not climbing to a mountain peak. You're basically going in a big circle. And that's a 100-mile loop right there. You can see Chamonix. Uh, and that's the touristy resort that most of us have been to when we've been to the Swiss, the French Alps. But you start just a couple miles to the south in Les Ouches, and then you hike over one pass to the next night, and then you hike over another pass, and you take a, a bus into Cormeur, and you spend a night in the Italian city, which, by the way, is connected with Chamonix by a tunnel under Mont Blanc. And then you take a bus to the end of the road, and you hike over another mountain pass, and catch a bus to another town, and then you do another day's hike. And at the very end, instead of doing the standard uh, return into Chamonix, we cheated a little bit. We went to the border. Uh, they gave us a lift from the hotel. We caught a bus into La Flagier, and then we went up on the mountain lift, and we hiked for five hours along the balcony, the south balcony, the Balcon du Sud, and then we took the lift from La Bravant into Chamonix. And that was a glorious finish because it was high altitude with great views of Mount Blanc the whole time. We didn't see Mount Blanc much otherwise. This point here, I put three fingers to remind you, is where the three countries come together, Italy, France, and Switzerland. When you cross the border, you don't even know you've crossed a border. And there's no, I mean, we didn't even have any COVID concerns. It was like a vacation from COVID. Didn't even think about it when we're up there. This is Les Ouches. We had glorious weather. Don't get too bummed out about bad weather reports. The weather report looked terrible every day. And every day we had good weather. So we only had one hour of rain the whole time, but you gotta be prepared. We, we hiked with our rain gear and uh, assuming there'd be rain. But this is, uh, this is our gang. We've got uh, my girlfriend, Shelly. We've got David Preston who works at Twin Cities Public Television. I've worked for, with him for ages on public television and David's partner, Sue. And together we went through the ceremonial arch that kicks off the Tour du Mont Blanc. We started, the first day was the easiest day by far. We took a lift up, so we didn't gain any altitude that day. Everybody puts on their mask, you take the lift up to the top. I wanna to remind you, we did our tour the first weekend, the first week in September, and that was the last week of the season. Then things start shutting down. Then lifts shut down, public buses shut down, hotels and restaurants shut down, and, it, and the, the snow comes in. So it's much tougher and more dangerous and less fun. So you want to do the hike in season. It's very, very popular. So you got to get reservations in advance. One reason I went with Max Adventures with the tour was so that somebody could do all the reservations for me because that was complicated. So on the first day, it was all below the tree line and it was just 
a good, good easy day to get used to the trail. The next day, we had the first of five very demanding days. And you can see on the trail sign here on the left, La Rolet, it's 1,500 meters above sea level. Well, you triple that and you add 10% to get feet. 1,500, triple that, 4,500, and you add 10%. It's 5,000 feet altitude right here. Typically, we would start at 5,000 feet, and we would climb 3,000 feet to get to the, to the mountain pass, and then we'd descend 3,000 feet. Each day, a 10-mile, six- or seven-hour hike, gaining 3,000 feet, dropping 3,000 feet, oftentimes starting with a mountain road like this, but most of it was with a trail. As we trained in Seattle, Shelly and I were not um, you know, great mountaineers, that's, that's, that's for sure. And David and Sue were not either. They would train at the Mall of America in uh, Twin Cities, and we would you know, train hiking around Green Lake or something in Seattle. Uh, but we did do a couple of major hikes in preparation just to see if we could do it. And we hiked uh, in Seattle area, there's a mountain called Mount Sai. Mount Sai is 3,000 feet altitude gain. That's a pretty good gain. It takes about four hours to get to the top of it. And uh, that became a unit of measurement for us. Every day, it was a Mount Sai a 1,000 meter, 3,000 foot gain. We got an early start. This is the sunrise uh, because we wanted to uh, have a long day. And we, if we got an hour earlier start, we could spend an hour more in the trail. It was really important for us philosophically not to be in a race to be done with the day's hike, but to uh, enjoy the moment. And we got really good at it. And there was a lot of fun moments. I mean, you'd have to make way for uh, a little surprise on the trail. Uh, you'd find these charming churches and beautiful flowers and mountain huts and trails like this. Almost all of our hiking was above the tree line. And that's what I like. I would have to say, though, that I was a little disappointed in the trail in the sense that there was no way to spend money all day long. There was no shops, no farmers selling yogurt, no nothing like that. It was way up in the high country, and uh, very rarely did we come upon a little alp that would have a cafe or some drinks for sale. And I expected a little more connection with commerce and the culture. I'm not complaining. Uh, it was just glorious to be above the tree line, and I'd rather be above the tree line with nothing to, no, nothing to shop for than below the tree line and not have all those mount glorious views. There's a nice example of the trail. And you'd come to, uh, there's a mountain uh, farm here, which had a, uh, picnic tables and drinks and people take a break. And here you can see the gear, the smart bag, the poles and the sunscreen. And then you get to your mountain pass. And this was always the good feeling. It was hard work. It was, it was, it was exhausting. I mean, you're, you're, you're climbing for three or four hours. And uh, I've never done that before for six days in a row. And, uh, but it was always very rewarding. When we got to the summit, it felt good. You see the other people that you know on the trail. Remember, everybody seems to go counterclockwise. That's the tradition. You start in Les Uches and you go counterclockwise. Uh, you can, some people specifically go clockwise because they don't want to see the same people all the time. But the general feeling is you get better views going counterclockwise. And I like it because you see the same people and you get to know them. But this is always a nice spot. You just take your shoes off. You have your, your fancy lunch. And a lunch, you know, I'm, uh, this to me was fancy. I got my water. I got a carrot. We split an apple. And I've got my ham and cheese sandwich with great bread. Oh, it's so nice to have a Swiss army knife. I haven't traveled with a Swiss army knife since 9-11. Uh, but since I was checking my bag anyways for my walking, my hiking poles, I tossed in the Swiss army knife. And that was kind of fun. But uh, this was the, the daily meal. You have to carry it, so you're not going to carry a lot of extra. And it was delicious. A carrot after hiking all morning with a view of Mount Blanc. Oh, baby. And I was, I was the stretching uh, uh, nut. I, I, I was stretching religiously. Because uh, I've done hikes before where I was just worthless after a day's hiking because I, I, I tightened up. So get serious about stretching. Every chance I had, I would stretch. Middle of the day, I'd stretch. In the morning, I'd stretch. At night, I'd stretch. And I was limber. I was never stiff. I was just feeling great. People thought I was kind of crazy, but it really was worth it.
stretch. Don't hike in Europe without stretching. Oh, look at this. So we went through, we went through uh, France, we went through Italy, then we went through Switzerland. And you know you're in Switzerland because the cows are patriotic. They wear their flag right there. Oh, this was a great spot. Hiked all morning and came to this mountain chalet mm. or this alpine farm. And they were doing quite a business. I think they're making more money selling, selling uh, lunches than they were milking cows. Yeah, it was a beautiful moment. Everybody's in a good mood. It's so nice to be high in the Alps, surrounded by positive people. Positive people. Nobody up there was anything but a, but a, 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 a sun ray uh, as, you, as you just embrace the world. Uh, lots of chance to take notes about future hikes and tips and so on. We've got a lot of information on our Facebook series. I've been posting a lot about this. If you're curious about the travels that I'm talking about today, uh, check out Rick Steves on Facebook. The I wanted to illustrate how the trails were rocky and the trails could be very steep. And if it was rainy, I think it'd be dangerous. We were, we were blessed with beautiful weather, uh, but here's hiking across an avalanche. And I was thankful I had those poles. Without those poles, I, I was surprised. There were some older people who were quite fragile that were doing the hike fine. I mean, they were experienced hikers, but they didn't have poles. There's, there, this is what you're gonna be dealing with a lot. And going uphill and going downhill, when you got those poles, they break you, they help, they help you stay safe. Uh, I, I thought we'd be fording a bunch of rivers, but this is the most uh, exciting river we got to ford. <laughs> it was beautiful. David and I had an ongoing thing about what's the best way to navigate. I'm kind of old school. I like an actual map. I'd study it the night before. I'd yellow highlight it. I just knew what was happening. And uh, David was much more into his um, digital navigation and his GPS. And, uh, and they both work. So you'll get a map. You should get a map. You should use the map and then follow the little blue dot because that'll tell you if you're on the trail or not. Your, your tour company, when you do this hike, make sure you have a good app, make sure you have all the information, and then you know what your options are. But you keep seeing TMB, Tour Mont Blanc, the Tour du Mont Blanc. And then you see that uh, famous trail signs that tell you how far it is to the next spot. What we did was we multiplied those times. Look at it. it says an hour, one hour and 30 minutes to get to Grand Col Ferrat. Well, that for us would be two and a half hours instead of one and a half hours. You multiply it by about 1.5 to get your casual way of doing it. And then you can always see what your Alps are in the bottom here. You see it's 2,000 meters. So that would be seven, 6,500 feet. You look for the painted sign on the rocks. That tells you you're on the trail. And if you don't see that and you feel like you're lost, you probably are. At the end of the day, you'd have usually an hour long, on a, a one mile or so walk on a road that gets you to the nearest bus station or that gets you to your hotel. So that was something I just became accustomed to, a long straight walk on a mountain road at the end of the day. Uh, and then you, you get to the, the end of the line for the bus, you hop on the bus and it takes you into the town where you've got your hotel waiting for you. This is the main town in Italy that we stayed at, Cormayor and uh, met a lot of Americans. These were some American travelers on, on the trail, in the hotels, and on the buses. Wonderful buses, by the way. Uh, public buses, Cormier again. From Cormier, we took the bus to the end of the line, continuing the circle around, and from there, we would hike and hike and hike. On the trail, you meet a lot of great people. Again, people are in a good mood. People are loving to talk. A good way to pass time if there's a boring stretch of the trail is just to start a conversation with somebody. I felt half of the people on the trail were Americans. And uh, everybody I met on the trail, I enjoyed talking with. This man was uh, celebrating his 60th birthday with his son. A lot of people were taking their little kids on the hike. I mentioned the last day. Uh, we went from La Flegiere all the way up to Plan Praz. And then we took a hike along the Tour de Mont Blanc at the very end called the South Balcony above Chamonix. And it was a five, four or five hour hike right on, it was a traverse. So up and down, but overall just straight. And you had glorious views of Mont Blanc all the way around. When we started the hike, I didn't think we were gonna make it. 
I mean, we were like a ship of fools without the ship. I mean, there were big carnivorous birds circling above us, I did, waiting for one to drop. Uh, and, uh, you know, all of us had, you know, little aches and pains. And it was our first day. It was downhill. We took the lift up. And we thought, how are we going to do this thing? But we took it easy. We never raced. When somebody wanted to take a break, we took a break. Generally, Shelly and I would hike together and uh, David and Sue would hike together and we'd meet each other at the, at the pass or something so we could go our own tempo. No hurry at all. If you have any problem, stop and fix it. I learned that from reading Cassandra's book. By the way, Cassandra, a link to Cassandra Overby is on the chat so you can learn more about her book. But I read that book and it taught me the importance of stretching and the gear and uh, navigation and how to be proactive so you don't have an uh, injury. And then we finally got back to Chamonix and we're um, mimicking the uh, hikers, the mountaineers from 200 years ago, looking up at the, with wonder at the greatest summit in all of Europe, Mount Blanc. Chamonix is a great place to finish your hike and have a celebratory dinner. And then you'll have a memory for the rest of your days. Oh, that was really great. Uh, at that point, David and Sue went one way and Shelly and I went into Paris. Shelly had never been to Paris before. We got on the train. Here's a reminder, uh, it's hard to travel in Europe without being vaccinated. On the train here, it says you need a ticket, you need a mask, and you have to have a certificate saying that you have been fully vaccinated. We're in the bullet train going very fast into Paris. And uh, when you get to Paris, everybody on the subway is wearing a mask. At the hotels, they, they will plate your lunch, your breakfast for you. You point to what you like. At the hotel, you get a, every hotel is a little different, but you, know, you show them your uh, vaccination card and you get the sanitary pass and then you're welcome to go into the dining room. This is uh, my one of my favorite uh, restaurateurs in Paris, Laurent, and he is uh, featured in our Paris guidebook. And I was so thankful I went to my favorite restaurants all over Europe this fall or wherever I traveled, and they were still in business after two terrible seasons of, of uh, the pandemic. Uh, and here at Le Florimond, uh, Laurent is checking the QR codes of his Parisian customers to make sure they are vaccinated. And Shelly and I had to show our CDC cards to make sure we were vaccinated, even to eat outside. And there's more eating outside these days in Europe than ever because of climate change and because of the pandemic. You need to show that you are vaccinated to get served. This is Rue Claire. And uh, Rue Claire is Rue Claire, pandemic or not. It just was every bit as charming and inviting and uh, sort of addictive as Rue Claire is any other year. Uh, you'd sit on your woven little chair, your rattan chair, and you would talk to the people next to you while you sip your wine and you dip your bread into your escargot juice. It's just, oh, I love my moments on Rue Claire. We got to uh, check in on the progress at the Notre Dame after the tragic fire, went to the great museums. When you go into a museum in Europe, you'll be wearing your mask. Whenever you're inside, uh, at least as long as the pandemic is, is going strong, you will be wearing a mask and you will prove that you're vaccinated to get into that museum. Of course, when you're eating, you take your mask off. And if you're posing for photographs like these Americans who like our TV show and we're having lunch at the Orsay Gallery in the cafeteria up on the top floor, uh, we have a chance to check in with them. One fun thing I love to do when I'm in Paris is a, it's a little routine. I hire a taxi or better yet, an Uber driver. And I rip out a page from my, the book that uh, the Rick Steves Guide to Paris. And it lists all the greatest spots uh, that are floodlit at night. And the whole idea is, it's written in the, the, the instructions are in French with the map. You give it to your Uber driver and he drives you to each of the famous night spots. Here we are, Place de la Concorde. And you say in French on that page you give him, stop here, please. We're going to get out and do a little happy jig and take a selfie. And then we'll get back in the car and we'll drive to Napoleon's tomb. And we'll get out and we'll do a little happy jig and take a selfie. And then we'll get back in the car and we'll drive to, I forget the name of this, but uh, we'll drive to this big tall thing and do our little happy jig and take a selfie. Uh, that's the uh, floodlit tour of Paris. And when you're done, you get the bill and it cost us 45 euros. What's that? That's about $55. And it was a beautiful hour and a half, the luxury of our own Uber. And uh, we got to know our driver and it was a lot of fun. But that's the kind of creative sightseeing that we like to innovate and describe and help people do in our different guidebooks covering all of Europe. So that was just an amazing experience. And I, I just feel like I'm just like uh, over the top happy about it, but it was a great time. And, and as soon as we got done with it, Shelly and I are just thinking, where are we going to hike next year? It's an amazing thing, those long distance hikes in Europe. 
Hey, Gabe, do we have any questions? We do have a lot of wonderful questions, Rick. Um, starting off, a number of people, including Zara, want to know how you selected your hiking poles. My hiking pole. I'll tell you how I did not select them. I went to REI and I found hiking poles for like $100. And I said, that doesn't make much sense. So I just bought these online. People want to know what are the, um, what's the, the make. And I don't even want to tell you because I don't care what the make was. It's just, I mean, it's just a good solid hiking pole. They cost me $40, nothing fancy. Uh, and you got, but you want to get a good leather grip. I say the big deal is you want collapsible ones instead of ones that fold up. You want them to telescope. Because when you're going downhill, you want them a little longer. And when you're going uphill, you want them a little shorter, you see. Um, but it's just, for me, the rhythm of this. For six hours, I love it. It just, it connects me with the earth. It steadies me. It makes me feel like I'm not going to fall and trip. And um, I, just, I just really love them, yeah. We also have a question from Laura, who's wondering if um, uh, with the altitude, are there any considerations that she, that people should take about altitude sickness? Is that you know, something that a lot of people experience? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any concern at all. Maybe I'm just um, Superman with my lungs or something, but I, I think I'm just normal. And I, you know, you feel a little light when you're at 8,000 feet. But remember this trail, I mean, it's a good question if you're going to the summit. But we never summited anything. We went to mountain passes. So think of the mountain passes. You know, you're not going to the tip top. You're going over the saddle. And it feels like in the tip top a little bit because a little monument there and it's celebratory. But you're basically sleeping at 5,000 feet and hiking up to 8,000 feet. 5,000 feet, 8,000 feet. Um, and um, most people have driven over a mountain pass that's higher than that and didn't even hardly, hardly feel it. When you're in Chamonix and you go at the top of Aiguille du Midi, you're going 12,600 feet. That's, that's a lot higher. That's 50% 50, 50, 50 higher. And there you really feel light, lightheaded. And that's an issue. And I felt lightheaded when I was going to base camp on Mount Rainier because that was a lot higher. But 8,000 feet, people were talking about getting pills for the altitude and they just said, Keep it simple, and it wasn't an issue. So, um, Rick, we saw you munching on your mountaintop carrot, yes. um, and David was wondering, um, did you pack all of your own food and lunches, or were you able to get food from some of the, the mountain huts and chalets? You know, that was my <laughs> disappointment. It was, no, there was, there was one day where we found out, oh, there's probably two days out of the six where you could have bought something, but you couldn't count on it. And what I learned is every morning you can buy a sandwich from your hotel. I mean, they're accustomed to making a sandwich for you and it cost you 10 or $12 to have a nice sandwich made. Uh, but I'd rather go to the grocery store and spend $3 or $4 and have a better sandwich. So my trick some days just out of convenience, I'd have the hotel make one, but the very best sandwiches were the ones that, and the most gratifying ones and the ones that cost nothing compared to the hotels were the ones you get at the grocery store and they'll make a sandwich for you with beautiful bread, lots of great Alpine cheese and, and a hearty meat. And then, you know, you get a hunk of uh, some kind of fruit and some kind of vegetable and you got your water. And I'll tell you, I brought a little tablecloth, which was a nice little treat and um, my Swiss army knife. And you just, you're so basic. It's so fundamental and you feel so healthy when I'm, when I'm walking and I'm kind of enthusiastic because I'm not that in shape. And I got in shape over the course of this. But one thing great about the walking, the, the hiking poles is you're working from the waist up. So obviously you're gonna work on your legs by hiking. But when you do this, your whole body is getting the workout and um, you're sharing the work. And uh, after it was all done, your whole being is, is happier. I feel like I'm an advertisement for tours that we don't do at Rick Steve's Europe because <laughs> <laughs> we don't do these tours. But uh, there's great hikes all over Europe and it's just an option. But I like it because you're mixing the culture. You're, you're, you're hiking with people from around Europe. You're, you're, you're getting great food every night. And this is probably the starkest hike you could do. Stark meaning you're just up above the trees and it's just rocks and views. Uh, you know, you could do hikes that go from pub to pub with all sorts of cute little shops filled with 
you know, refrigerator magnets uh, if you hike around Cornwall in England or something like that. So Rick, we have one more question for this first Q&A and it comes from, well, Mila, but many others were wondering, you you talked about your, your water bottle and staying hydrated and um, an hour later after you've hydrated well, um, what sorts of facilities are there um, and bathroom facilities are there along the trail? I don't want to be disrespectful and laugh at that question, but there's not a hint of a civilized place to take a pee, I'll tell you that. So, you know, you do what the dogs and the, and the marmots do. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you don't, uh, yeah, you just find a rock and you, you go behind a rock. <laughs> but you got to, you, you, you can, you can uh, leave uh, biomass, but of course, <laughs> you don't leave any litter anywhere. I mean, I was very impressed by how clean the trail was. And on that cheery note, um, <laughs> we're going to carry on here. Uh, thanks, Gabe. And thanks to everybody for their questions. I want to um, right now just I want to remind people that uh, we couldn't have Monday night travel without our staff without our crew. And uh, we've got four people on our Monday night travel crew. And uh, because we're a travel company, two of them are traveling right now. Uh, Lisa is in Turkey, and every winter we like to subsidize a tour of Turkey uh, with the tour with the with our friends in Turkey that give the do the Rick Steves tours in Turkey, and we want our guides to have a chance to to bond to have an experience that really is exciting. That the I took more of my loved ones on our Turkey tour than on any of the other tours put together. That's the tour I took on my my loved ones on because I wanted to have that experience of getting to know a Muslim nation with such a rich history. Uh, but we've got uh, twenty five guides right now. Uh, traveling together in Turkey on our Best of Turkey tour. And Lisa's one of them. Uh, also, Ben is one of our staff and he's studying for a year in Russia, in St. Petersburg. And uh, we've got working tonight, we've got uh, Gabe and we've got Julianne. So thanks to all you guys for making Monday night travel possible. And thanks to everybody for joining us. I wanna remind you next Monday, we're gonna go to underground Europe and uh, that is a fascinating corner of Europe, I'll tell you. Uh, two weeks from tonight, we're gonna celebrate Christmas in different countries around Europe. Uh, and I've got some beautiful video clips to share with you. Traditional, beautiful, sacred, family, wonderful Christmases, full of music, full of joy. Uh, two, night, two weeks from tonight, that's the 13th of December. Then we're gonna take a few weeks off and we're gonna kick off next year on, I think it's January 3rd, with a special show on the best of Switzerland. So lots of travels coming up. Um, and I uh, wanna remind you also links to everything we're talking about today are in the chat section. So if you're curious, you might just wanna uh, click on the chat there and see what the links are and grab some of those links because uh, there's a lot of helpful information there. I do wanna remind you that this is a Christmas sale time all over the place and at ricksteves.com in our travel store, everything is between 20 and 50% off. Uh, and that means, uh, well, everything, our bags, our, uh, our books, our uh, DVDs, our gear, uh, our calendars. We got the new 2022 calendars out, the wall hanging one and the every day has a different uh, uh, photograph and travel tip. And those are very popular and they're uh, deeply discounted. Also, um, Audible, which is the main supplier of audiobooks, uh, I think, for people who like audiobooks, loves this book, For the Love of Europe. I, I love this book. This is my favorite 100 uh, experiences in Europe. And at the beginning of COVID, I locked myself in a recording studio for six days, and I actually had a joy reading this 400-page book. And Audible likes the way I read it. And uh, they're offering this as their featured, one of their featured books, audiobooks, uh, uh, just today and tomorrow. And it's just $5 if you're um, on board with audio. It's $5 for this book. And that would be a fun opportunity if you want to snare that. So lots of good things going on that way. And now let's, I think what we'll do before we um, head back to Europe, uh, I want to take you, well, to head back to Europe, I want to take you to Rome and show you uh, the Pantheon and how they are organizing that for visitors during COVID. So you can see the Pantheon and you can be sure to be safe. Hey, I'm Rick Steves. I'm in Rome at the Pantheon, and I'm just checking the way things are working during the pandemic as people are more and more traveling. Here we have the uh, health security line. And, uh, you know, there's a long line here of tourists that want to get in and see the Pantheon. And you have to show your CDC card or your green pass if you're a European. And they check that very carefully. 
and then you check your temperature. And that lets you know if you're healthy. And then, of course, there's a long line here. But uh, the good news is you get to go into the Pantheon and it's almost empty. And to be alone in the Pantheon, ah, that's an experience people haven't enjoyed for a long, long time. You know, um, there's a positive energy. Things are opening up. And right now, the focus is on let's make sure everybody's got their vaccination and let's make sure we can enjoy the wonders of Europe and be healthy at the same time. Happy travels from Rome. Okay, and now we're going to meet a bunch of our tour guides. And I just got a little clip here that illustrates how uh, in Italy, they're taken care by taking people's temperature before they let them into the mall. We were taking a walk through Rome and we wanted to just spontaneously step into this mall. And here you'll see how they just check your temperature. And all of these people who are getting their temperature taken are people that you're going to meet on this next little slideshow. They are Rick Steves tour guides. I'm Rick Steves. I'm in Rome and we are traveling and we've got our masks and we get our temperature taken, but we're traveling and Rome feels great. So, you know, I don't want to promote traveling to Europe during COVID times necessarily, but I just want to share what it's like. Uh, it's it's a difficult thing right now. We've got some you know disconcerting news about COVID with the new variant, and uh, nobody knows what the future holds. It's just if you want to travel, there are thousands of people traveling right now. Half of my staff is in Europe, just on vacation right now. It's just a beautiful time to be in Europe if you don't mind traveling during COVID. And I just want to show you a little bit about what it's like. I want to remind you, as as Gabe mentioned. Two weeks ago, Cameron and I did a special episode of Monday Night Travel dedicated just to pandemic travel. That's where all the practical information about traveling during COVID is. But right now, I want to take you with our guides. And I had the great opportunity of mentoring our new class of guides. And these are 25 or so young guides. Most of them, I think all of them, are already professional guides. They, do, they work for other tour companies or they work on their own, but they want to be on a Rick Steves tour. And what I want to do was personally mentor them so they know what distinguishes a Rick Steves tour from a regular tour in Europe. It's not necessarily a qualitative difference. It's a stylistic difference. And if you like the Rick Steves style of a tour guide, you got to have a consistent tour guide because I know a lot of people take five or 10 or 15 of our tours. And one thing they always say is we can always count on the fact that our guide will be excellent. So I want to make sure we continue that. So we had the great joy of having this group join us. And we did, we just booked one of our tours. We booked our Heart of Italy tour, 10 days in Rome, Volterra, my favorite hill town, the Cinque Terre, my favorite hunk of the Riviera, and Florence, the greatest art capital. And we used that as an example for teaching all of these guys who are from countries, there's, there's, there's all over Europe, from Portugal to Ireland to Greece to Poland. We have guides right here. And we just had a great time uh, letting them be the tourists and the guides in training. And me, Tara, and Ben from my office, who are the senior guides, got to do the guiding. And here we are in the first night at the hotel. It's our welcome meeting, stressing to the group and demonstrating how to do a good orientation talk, because that's a very important time to set the tempo. What do we mean by, by the efficiency of a group and group think and uh, maximizing experiences and orient and disperse and, uh, uh, you know, the importance of punctuality and giving a concise talk and earning people's attention and identifying anxiety and getting rid of it. These are philosophical points that we need to teach and stress and our guides learn about that. Then we went out on the streets and Ben is just an amazing guide. And he took the guides on a walk through Rome, illustrating what is a good walk and how we do that on a Rick Steves tour. Here we are at the Trevi Fountain. And there's a lot of, it's not so much about 
who is, you know, who is the architect and, and, and what's the statue about in the Trevi Fountain. It's how to communicate, how to keep the group together, how to, um, to, to read the group and, uh, and how, to temp how to pace the tour and these kind of uh, uh, tips for giving a good tour. One thing that distinguishes our tour is the characters the person that, that, that run our favorite hotels and restaurants. These are personality driven hotels and restaurants. This is Paula. She's got an amazing little restaurant and we've been taking groups there for 20 years. She's been serving groups or serving travelers. She reminded me on this night for 60 years. And she was so happy to see us. And we were so happy to see Paula, but this is the kind of people that really bring to life what great travel is all about. We were wandering around floodlit Rome and seeing scenes that just brought me great joy because it's the same positive energy, the, the same love of life that you find in normal times that we see now in Europe, even during the pandemic. And I have concluded after uh, over a month of travel in Europe this last fall, uh, that thankfully the people that run our hotels and restaurants have survived the pandemic. This is Anna Marie, and we've been bringing our groups to her hotel, Hotel Aberdeen, for more than 20 years. And uh, she has had a very tough two years, as have we, but she's still standing, and she is so eager to get going again. And that's what we all hope to do in 2022, God willing. At uh, Anna Marie's hotel, they serve breakfast like this, so you don't get spread germs. All the cereal is already pour poured and in little dishes, as you see there. Every hotel has a different way to keep it hygienic. We wanted our guides to meet good guides and see good guides in action. Our favorite guide in Rome is Francesca. If you've been on one of our tours, you probably know and love Francesca. Francesca gave us a talk about how to give a talk, and then she gave us a walk, a guided tour through the Pinacoteca, the art gallery at the Vatican Museum. And to have Francesca right there in front of Raphael's transfiguration, explaining the magic of that wonderful art Renaissance masterpiece, it really inspires our guides to do a great job. Going into St. Peter's Basilica, the greatest church in Christendom, it was a beautiful opportunity just to get there and just to be there again. It's such a wonderful space. But I was curious about how they took care of people's um, safety health-wise. I mean, on the right is a statue that goes back well over a thousand years of St. Peter. And when you look at St. Peter, you notice his toe is pretty much kissed and rubbed and prayed off. You know, for centuries, pilgrims have come there and, and venerated St. Peter by rubbing and kissing his toe. Well, of course, you can't do that during the pandemic. So there's a rope there that keeps all the pilgrims away. Uh, this is our bus, and our guides were experiencing a tour just like their tour members will. And with a Rick Steves tour, you've got 25 people on a 50-seat bus, so you already have social distancing. Everybody's wearing a mask. And we're kind of just testing out what's it going to be like to do tours if we have to have these standards. And, you know, we'll have whatever standards are necessary to make sure that we don't compromise people's health and safety. Here's Tara explaining to the groups the importance on a Rick Steves tour of communicating so people know what is the plan. And every day the guide will write out a um, uh, itinerary so people know exactly what's planned today. People take a photograph of that and they're all set. Uh, all of our young guides had a chance to grab the mic and give a talk. This is my son, Andy, who's a wonderful young guide. And Andy uh, was along with us so that he could also pick up some tips about how I like tours to be done. I love to get the group in a circle and to be able to talk to everybody without the whisper system and without yelling. And also this is a chance to demonstrate the name game. We have a memory aid game where we all learn each other's names because we think that's important on a tour. For decades, we've been going in Volterra to the Alabaster Workshop. And that is a place anybody can drop into, but it's fun to be able to go there and have the artisans explain to us what they're doing as they carve the alabaster. Each guide gets to play to their own fortes. If you're into music, if you're into history, if you're into wine, you can specialize in that. Francisco is a sommelier and he knows his wine and he did a beautiful talk inspiring us to give better wine talks. And our guides took us in the streets and I just got to call on one of the guides and then they had to ad lib a little walk down the street sharing what they knew from looking at what they saw. This is the Italian Riviera, the Cinque Terre, the town Monteroso al Mare in October. And it was sunny and it was warm and it was not crowded, which was quite nice. We had a great day on the Riviera. I enjoyed demonstrating to the group what it's like to take the group uh, from the hotel to dinner and turn that into an orientation walk. Uh, uh, what are you gonna do tomorrow? What's the lay of the land? What's a little context? And then when you get to the restaurant, you have the chef come out and explain to people what's cooking. 
And then we go into the restaurant and we understand the food and it's going to be a festival of fresh seafood filling this ancient style amphora. And when they dump that into the big, big bowl, you know, if you love seafood, this is going to be an unforgettable meal. And if you don't love seafood, it's just more for the rest of us. I mean, what a meal. And, uh, you know, I wanted to stress with the group and we demonstrated it by being there that when you take 25 people to a dinner in Europe, when they're on a tour, the guide is not sitting there enjoying him or herself. The guide is working. 25 people are having a meal of their life. And the guide needs to make sure that people are having a good time, that they're getting what they need, that they're comfortable, uh, you know, that they understand uh, what they're eating, uh, that, that they're communicating well with the waiters. It's really important for the guide to um, cheerlead and facilitate that dining experience until the last muscle is eaten. Mm. One thing I really enjoyed was demonstrating and then letting the guides share how they do that, how to make a complicated chunk of history palatable and easy to get your brains around. And uh, uh, we just had, the, the, the group just really bonded. We had, a, it's just a wonderful group. We want to deal with anxiety. When you leave the hotel in the morning, you don't know what's going to happen. You, you know, you got to catch a train and then the train goes somewhere and it catches the bus and then how long until the rest stop and so on. So here Ben is uh, demonstrating how you have 20 people or 25 people, whatever, uh, without any chaos, without any rush, without any anxiety, checking out of the hotel, getting onto the train, riding the train, getting off the train and getting onto the bus. As we were leaving, I love to get just a shot that shows everybody. This is early in the morning, right after breakfast, on the way to the train as we leave the Cinque Terre. These are our guides that are getting ready to guide all of our travelers in the next ah. season. And you pay for it in vertical. <laughs> Buongiorno. 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 And we're off to catch the train. Beautiful stop on the Cinque Terre. And now our group of guides is heading for Firenze, Florence. Oh, Cinque Terre in October. Not bad. So that was just a month ago. It sure is a nice time to be on the Cinque Terre. Hey, um, we like to find, you know, fun, unforgettable, um, distinctive ways to teach art and art history. For instance, you can build a Gothic cathedral out of human beings. It takes 13 tourists, or in this case, 13 guides to build a Gothic cathedral. It's a skeleton of support. You need six pillars. You have the pillars all bring their arms together. Those are ribs, architecturally speaking, to make pointed arches. And then you have buttresses, not, not, not regular buttresses, but, but flying their support in with arches, becoming flying buttresses. Then when you got your columns supported by your flying buttresses with arches that are pointed, so the weight of the spire, when she hoists herself up, doesn't go down, but goes out. That distinguishes Gothic architecture, and you've got a solid skeleton of support there. And after you build your Gothic, your Gothic church out of tourists, you step into a Gothic cathedral and it makes a little more sense. And I had an ulterior motive here because I want to include it in our art TV series. So when the group left, I met my crew and there you see in the background filming Carl, the cameraman. And we built after all that practice, a beautiful Gothic cathedral out of 13 tourists there in Florence. And that will be a little bit of our art series that'll be coming out in public television a year from now. So we had a great time. And like any tour group, an emotional last evening after our final dinner and hugs on the main square. And then that group took off. Now we meet the TV crew. I took a little time myself. I just had a nice peaceful dinner. And when I, this is the, the balcony of my room in Florence with a view of the, the Duomo. Just want to point out, you know, you can go to fancy dinners all the time, but remember you can also just have a little $4 picnic feast. And I just, I'm so happy sometimes just having a grocery store dinner like this with a, a setting like that. Okay, so now we meet our TV crew. And uh, before we do that, I just want to um, show you just a little clip. And what we're gonna do is, uh, first of all, uh, when you go to the Uffizi Gallery, uh, you'll find that it is closed on Monday. 
And it's closed on Monday because that's when TV crews are there and they're moving around the art and uh, VIPs are there with a the private tour. Uh, anybody can go to the Uffizi on Monday, but it costs you $1,000 an hour. So we're going to do that right now, just so you can see what it's like to film in the Uffizi. Hey, I'm Rick Steves, and it is such a thrill to be in the Uffizi Gallery all alone on a Monday. Of course, this is famously the day tourists cannot see it, but that's when film crews are doing their work. And here, we're seeing Michelangelo's easel painting. Now look, when you got that light, you see the light they let us shine on that, the colors just pop and it's just glorious footage. Tondo, we're seeing some beautiful, beautiful portraits. Raphael. The wool merchants by Raphael. Look at the jewelry, look at the beautiful, beautiful embroidery. Look at the noble faces. And we're getting Raphael's beautiful Madonna of the gold vintage. Ah. We're off and running, making an incredible European art series, and I am excited to share this beautiful art. Man, I'm so steeped in beautiful art. I'm so fortunate to be able to do this, and we are just collecting six hours from the pyramids to Picasso. It's going to be amazing. I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute, but here is a one minute clip on the piano because I wanted to remind people art is for your eyes, but it's also for your ears. And this is a little clip about Baroque art. And we talked in uh, some friendly people that run a hotel in Florence to let us use their nice piano. It happens to be a hotel that our tour group stay at. So they were more than welcoming with our TV crew. Hey, when it comes to Baroque music, I mean, imagine this, Bach, Handel, Scarlatti, they were all born the same year, 1685. The music is like Bernini for your ears. You can talk about Baroque art, but you gotta remember that it's more than visual arts. It's art for your ears as well. When you think about music, you can have two different melodies dancing together in Baroque, like this Bach invention. And another feature of Baroque is ornamentation. And in music, that means trills. Check out this Scarlatti. Hey, if you're going to play Baroque music, it's nice to have ruffles on your sleeves. <laughs> ah, nice to be able to bring in a little bit of music to all the visual arts. Now, I want to take you back to the slideshow and show you a little bit about how our crew is working. I'm so lucky to have such a great crew. In each city, we hired a local guide to be with us. We wanted to get a local voice. Um, we spent four days in Florence, four days in Rome, and four days in Athens. This is our crew with Elena, wonderful local guide in Florence. And we had access to the great, great galleries of the town and art that was in situ hanging there where it was designed to be 800 years ago, like this amazing Jacques Doe fresco. Uh, uh, fresco. Um, and art that showed, made a point. I mean, look at that, look at the, the depth right there in that wall. That, that was just an artist that was excited to be able to do it. And he knew the mathematical laws of perspective to show depth, and he illustrated that in spades. The faces taking you right back 500 years ago to Florence, that elegant town, and then to be there alone in those great museums, filming the Botticelli, the Michelangelo. Oh, this beautiful Botticelli, oh my goodness. And one thing I wanted to do was show artists in action. We showed uh, mosaic makers, we showed painters with oil paint compared to tempera, we showed uh, fresco, and I wanted to show marble being carved. And it really clarified something for me that the great statues that we see in marble, they generally start out as a, as a, a clay model. And that, the artist told us, is where the real art is, to make the original clay model. Then he makes a plaster cast of that. And then with the plaster cast, he carves, with the help of a measuring device, the actual marble uh, original, the, the, the marble statue. And we got to film that. And that's just going to be a beautiful part of our show. Another thing that I take huge pride in is choosing nice places 
to have for odd cameras. So we're running around town trying to find the best places. This is a beautiful facade of a church in, in Trastevere, Santa Maria in Trastevere, one of the oldest churches in Rome. And we wanted a, just a playground of beautiful ancient spots to have different on cameras. And we went out to Hadrian, Emperor Hadrian's villa. You know, there were billionaires in the old days too. And billionaires do crazy things with their money these days. And they did crazy things with their money in 2000 years ago. And 2000 years ago, Emperor Hadrian, he was a great traveler and his favorite thing to do is come home and rebuild his favorite sites that he saw on the road in his villa. Today, they are standing delicately, just waiting a film crew to stand there and make a beautiful on camera. We had a great time, but we were there on the day of the G20 when uh, the great economic leaders of the world were in town. The city was closed down. There was carabinieri everywhere. Helicopters filling the sky had a tough time getting much done on that day. But it was great to be working again, enjoying the art of Rome. Oh my goodness. And with a story to tell. We've got 90 pages of script to cover and there's beautiful art to make these points. I mean, remember, most of the statues you look at are actually 2,000-year-old copies of 25-year-old originals, 2,500-year-old originals. And uh, a lot of times, they would literally copy these things, I mean, side by side with one of those measuring devices, like the discus thrower. If you've been in the Vatican in the last decade, you've not seen it this empty. But now, during COVID, it's, it's much less crowded. And this was the Grand Hall. That's usually a shuffle, just a mosh pit of travelers. I went into the early Christian art section of the Vatican Museum. This is from ancient Rome. The last century of Rome was Christian. And you can see Jesus portrayed as the Good Shepherd. You can see manger scenes from the 300s. You can see sarcophagi carved out of porphyry, the hardest stone you'll ever encounter. We went to the Etruscan Center where you've got Etruscan, beautiful mass, just beautiful art that, that's from before Rome. I mean, this would have been, you know, the Etruscan civilization five, 600 years before Christ, uh, right there on the Italian peninsula. And of course, the Raphael rooms. There's a self-portrait of Raphael himself. Foreshortening, normally I wouldn't care about that, but that's a great example of foreshortening. And that's part of the Renaissance. And part of ancient Rome is a mosaic of a gladiator creating a martyr, killing somebody, dragging him behind a chariot chariot. We cannot travel light when we're filming, uh, but that's pretty light for a film crew. That's our crew. It's me, Simon, and Carl with that much luggage. And we're on our way to Athens. Great thing about Athens is the Parthenon doesn't have the scaffolding it's had for so long. They've been busy during the pandemic. And uh, let me just show you a little clip here about what it feels like to be on top of the Acropolis in 2021, in Athens. Hey, I'm Rick Steves. I'm in Athens on the Acropolis. Athens is an amazing city. Look at that. They say out of the 10 million people in Greece, 4 million live in Greater Athens. You can see four out of every 10 Greeks from the top of this hill. This hill is the sacred heart of ancient Greece. I've been coming here for 20 years to film the Acropolis and the Parthenon, the iconic symbol of Greece's golden age, has never looked so good. Look at that, no scaffolding on this end of the building. We're here filming. We're making our, what I'm very excited about, our European art history series, six one hour shows. And boy, we're featuring ancient Greece like you can't imagine. Oh, this is my, uh, this is my microphone. We don't like to show an ugly mic, so we hide it. We, we just tape it in here because there's too much great art to see. You don't want to be distracted by some ugly mic. Ha! But we're right here. It's great to be back on the road. It's November 2021. It's a hot, beautiful day. And we're enjoying one of the great wonders of art and culture in Europe. Happy travels from Athens. Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. It was sure nice to be there without the heat. I mean, this was October and it was comfortable and it was just great filming. This is Nikki, who is our guide in Athens. And we were looking around Athens for some of her favorite street art. It really helps to have a local guide who knows where the best street art is because that's part of our art series as well. If you're going to ride the metro in Athens, just like anywhere, you need to wear your mask. And then before going home, 
you got to go get your negative test or test and hope it's negative. And that's something that Cameron and I talked about in the Monday Night Travel two weeks ago that you can watch if you look into our archives anytime you want to learn more about all the ins and outs of pandemic travels. But I wouldn't worry about what you need to have before you can fly home until you're ready to fly home and then ask the person at your hotel, what do you need? Probably you need a passenger locator form filled out from the airline you're using. You need a CDC card promising or proving that you've been vaccinated and you need to get a negative test. And your hotel knows where to get it. You can do a little home kit if you want, but I just think it's worth 20 euros to go down the street to a pharmacy. I've done it several times and it's there's never any way. It's very professional. And then you get your physical printout that says you got a negative test and you are ready to fly home. All right. Hey, um, Gabe, I think it's time for some questions. We have some wonderful questions tonight, Rick, but before we get to those, uh, could we have our quick word from our sponsor for the week? Hey, our sponsor. Let me, uh, I've already talked about what we do to make money. Uh, let me talk about uh, Giving Tuesday because today's Monday Night Travel and tomorrow is that one Tuesday a year that's dedicated to philanthropy. And if you wanna give an extra oomph to your holiday season, I would think seriously about finding a creative way to make a difference. What I do every Christmas season is I support Bread for the World so that they can lobby for hungry people in the halls of Congress. And, you know, lobbying, we think of as bad words sometimes, but that's because sometimes people lobby for things we don't believe in. But if you believe in taking care of poor and hungry people collectively as a society, then you care about lobbying for hungry people in the halls of Congress. And I'm so thankful that we can help earn a place at the table when it comes to our government making policies that have a direct impact on poor and hungry people in our country and south of the border. So what I do is I try to talk 5,000 people every holiday season, 5,000 travelers, just like each of you, into giving $100 to Bread for the World. And if you can give $100 to Bread for the World, I will give $100 also. And that means 500,000 from everybody else and 500,000 basically from you and me, Gabe, and 100 other people that work with us at Rick Steves Europe because we work really hard, take a lot of people to Europe and we wanna give back. We will then produce a thousand, no, that's a million dollars to help empower Bread for the World. I've been supporting Bread for the World for 30 years. And to me, it's the way I get leverage out of my philanthropic dollar. To make it even more fun, to step up to the plate for this challenge, what we do is we offer people who want to give $100 so that $200 goes to Bread for the World, we give them the three Christmas gifts that we've produced with our Christmas show in Europe. It's the book that I wrote after learning so much more than we could put in the show about European Christmas and all the different countries around Europe. It's the show itself with some great DVD extras that you would never see on TV. And it's a CD that has all of my favorite music from Europe that we recorded and featured in the show, 20 pieces that really freshen up your Christmas music selection. So these are all yours as a thank you from me. I pay for the shipping. I pay for all of this and Bread for the World gets every dollar that you would donate. And if you'd rather have not the Christmas gifts, but every TV show we've ever made in a 16 disc box set, you can have that instead. So there's a link in the chat section to Bread for the World, or you can go to bread.org or you can go to ricksteves.com slash bread. But if you find out about Bread for the World, if you care about, um, if you believe that collectively we can embrace this idea of love your neighbor. It's a very exciting thing to do. And um, it's something worth learning more about. So that's a word from our sponsor is do something good on Given Tuesday. And that's tomorrow. Let's have questions, Gabe. All right, Rick. Our first question is from Vicki, um, who was wondering, I mean, I know that you've talked in the past about the origins of Rick Steves Europe tours and you driving people around in a van. Um, now, when you look at when you were at the, on this guides training tour and looking at what the tour program has become, what would you say is still at the heart of a Rick Steves tour that makes it different and unique um, that has really stayed the same throughout those years? Here's something that is at the heart of a Rick Steves tour. Look at that bus. Does that look like fun? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. There, there, I should say, there were no tour members on top of the bus <laughs> on the tours that I was on. No, that's actually, no, that's a different story. I've got some stories that I've written about, but I'm just working on a book. This is a book I'm writing. It's on the hippie trail. It's my journal from Istanbul to Kathmandu. 
And that was the most impactful trip I've ever made. That was in 1978. And this is just a mock-up, but I'm, I'm going to Detroit tomorrow to make a pledge drive. And this 180 page book, we're just taking it to the printer in the next week or so, is going to be one of the gifts. And it's only available as a thank you for people supporting public television. But I'm sort of in the mood of those minibus. That's just the bus at the border of Afghanistan. That's just a public bus. Um, but I used to drive minibus tours originally. And um, I was the guide and the driver, and there was just eight people on the bus. And it was just really an amazing thing. But we would literally have, we'd, when we drove through the oak forest that provided these, the uh, beam, the um, masts for Admiral Nelson's ships for Britain, you know, they came from that forest. I mean, this amazing forest. Um, and we would have somebody, we would take turns sitting on the top of the minibus as we cruised slowly through the forest and they could just be lost in the wonder of that forest, that historic forest. We don't do those kind of things anymore. Uh, but we have this origin that goes back to experience. When somebody asks what distinguishes a Rick Steves trip, what do we teach today that it was all about when I was just driving a minibus around Europe? It's having hands-on experiences, you know, it's going into that sauna, it's sucking on that, um, you know, uh, nargile or that, that hookah, it's, it's going to the, the dog races, it's, uh, you know, um, it's, it's hiking under the moonlight, it's, uh, it's, it's having that escargot for your first time. It's so many things that you just, you've heard about it, but now you get to do it yourself. And that's really what distinguishes the Rick Steves tour. And related to that, Sue was wondering, what, what do you look for now that you, the program has grown and you don't lead every tour? Um, what do you look for in a great guide? Well, I not only don't lead every tours, I just don't lead tours anymore, really. We took a thousand tours around Europe in 1919 or 2019. And um, I take the tours now instead of leading them. Uh, but but uh, I love, I mean, a couple of times I've, I've, uh, I've gotten back into the saddle. I really enjoyed being the guide for our guides this last month. It was really fun. And what do we look for? I've been to conventions where they have all the people who are aspiring to be tour guides going and they speed date with all the tour operators. And you sit there at the table and you meet every 10 minutes, you meet a different person who's trying out for the part. And you meet 30 or 40 people over the course of the day. And I've never found anybody there that would be somebody I'd want to hire. It's the oddest thing. I find people who are teachers, people who are travelers, people who are mission driven to share their culture, uh, people that just, that just, thrive on enthusing about their culture. And what I like is somebody who understands American culture, but is also intimate with European culture. You see, that's really the, the good mix. And you can get that with an American guide and you can get that with a European guide, but you gotta have a foot in both cultures. You gotta be mission driven, you gotta enjoy it. And that's, I think it's an odd thing, but that's the mix. And if, you know, people take 10 of our tours, invariably, the thing they will comment on when I meet them is, every guide has been equally good. They take the first tour and they say, ah, I only want to go with Francesco, or I only want to go with Alfio, or I only want to go with uh, Helen, you know, and then uh, they go, well, she doesn't do that tour, he doesn't do that tour, okay, I'll try this other guy, but, and then that other guy's just as good, you see, that's, and for me, that's really something I'm very proud of and thankful for. When I worked in the travel center, we would read through a lot of tour reviews and I can definitely vouch for that. Yeah. Um, people just love all of our guides equally, I would say. Hey, I take the tours. Every, <laughs> every year I thumb through our catalog and I take a tour just because I want to be a student of these guides. You know, I'm the generalist. I can, I can kind of do it in every country, but I cannot do it like they do it in their own country. And uh, I just lap it up man, I just can't get enough of it. So um, I've been probably done most of our tours as a participant, because I just, it's like going to a great university and having very small class and being friends with the professor. So Rick, pivoting to um, the filming that you do in the, the TV production, Cecilia was wondering, have you started using drones in your filming? Um, to get some of these shots like of the of the Parthenon. Yes. Yeah, you know, and I remember in the old days, you could never do it. And then you, it was if you had a huge budget, you could do it with over, they had that over series, over Washington, over Colorado, whatever. 
and over Ireland. And that was all with helicopters and very expensive. And now you have drones and these drones have these little GoPros on them or something with uh, some way to level it out or I don't know how they do it, but we travel with a drone now and uh, we get, you know, we used to drive around for an hour to get a good wide shot of a town. And now we just go out before dinner on the deck of our hotel and send the drone up <laughs> and you get a wide shot of the town. There's the river, there's the, the steeple and there's the mountain. And it's like you have your own helicopter. It's an amazing thing to have a little drone that shoots broadcast quality television. You got to be careful because some countries don't allow you to have a drone and many areas don't allow you to fly your drone. So you got to be careful about that, but it's a real powerful tool for a little crew like ours. And Rick, the last question tonight actually comes from me. Um, so I know that you've been working on this art series. It's what you've been filming. And I'm curious if you could have a very convincing replica of any European art masterpiece on display in your home. We saw you introduced us to some of your art today. You could put up a replica of any masterpiece. What would you put up? <laughs> Looks like we have an answer. Oh. This is, this is by Gustav Klimt, mm -hmm. a wonderful uh, artist who does these uh, quilts or embroideries, you know, it's, it's handmade. It's wow. It's gorgeous. And I was up in the San Juan Islands at a little county fair and I found this and uh, wow, Mary Miller and uh, on, uh, on on Lopez Island. And uh, I was, uh, that's something that I just love, Klimt. But hang on, I got to put this down because I love it. <laughs> uh, the other thing I would have is um, Hieronymus Bosch. Mm. Hieronymus Bosch, the garden of earthly delights. It's a triptych. Mm -hmm. I can picture it. Oh, it's just heaven, hedonism, and hell. And it's just the transparency of earthly pleasures. And I have a good memory of that because when I was a piano teacher, I had kids sitting in the waiting room and I had this Bosch garden, a big thing, because I bought it at the Prado of, of, of a canvas you know, print of it. And I framed it and I hung it above the place where my, my little students, little 10 year olds would wait for their piano lesson when I was a piano teacher. And this thing, if you've never seen it, it's just a trip. This guy was the original surrealist and he was on wasn't pot it must have been mushrooms you know and it was tied in with his weird take on christianity and it's just five six five hundred years ago it's just amazing and my students would just they would just stare at it when they were waiting for their piano lesson and they would just look at it forever it was so far out and i just i love i Art that takes you back in time and, and Bosch takes you to another world, that's for sure. Hey, that was a, kind of a fun question, Gabe, thank you. Um, I wanna thank everybody for joining us. I wanna remind you that uh, next week we're going to underground Europe. It'll be a lot of fun. You can't believe all the wonders that are lurking underground in Europe. Two weeks from tonight, it's Christmas uh, on Monday Night Travel. And we're gonna go to a bunch of different places around Europe and celebrate Christmas. Then we're gonna take a couple weeks off and we're gonna kick off 2022 on January 3rd third, I believe it is, with uh, the best of Switzerland. So we are so thankful for you to join us every week. Uh, and uh, I want to remind you that uh, if you're not having fun in Europe, you're not making enough mistakes. And I want to finish off with a few of our mistakes. These are bloopers. And these are bloopers designed just for your pleasure. So let's go right now to bloopers. Happy travels. Um, this is ugly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, this is a big old... This is not... Hey, this is good. not ugly. <laughs> this is okay. ugly. Come here and see ugly. Uh, <laughs> ugly. America, bon appetito. America, bon appetito. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> Super Tuscan. Super Tuscan. Super Tuscan. All right, enough. Super Tuscan. Say something else. <laughs> Super? Super. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just. I am never going to have a food show, Peter. <laughs> and this one, the name is Soprassata, and uh, 
<laughs> you know him. You know him. You can you can peel it if you want. Yes. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Listen to me. You're not my type. You know. <laughs> Good night, Gabe. Good night, Rick. Good night, Julianne. Good night, Rick. Good night, Gabe. Good night, Julianne. Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us. See you next week. Yeah.